Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Pastor Tyrone P. Jones IV, and I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church of Guilford, House of Faith, where we believe in preaching, teaching, reaching, and healing. Our director of music has come up with a song that says, we are gathered to worship him, to lift up our voices in praise. We're glad you have joined us in celebration to God Almighty, wonderful Savior, Lord of Lord, to him who is the King of Kings. We welcome you to First Baptist Church. Thank you for coming today. God be praised. This service is a service designed so that we can worship the Lord to get the word and go out to serve. Thank you for joining us today. Come on back and see us anytime. But right now, let's get ready to go into worship. Good morning, First Baptist family and friends, and welcome to service. I know, I hope you, like me, want to meet Jesus one day and hope that he says to us, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and then we receive our crown. So join with us as we sing, I shall wear a crown.
my robe in glory. Shout, tell my story. Aren't you glad to be in God's house this morning? Good morning, First Baptist. I am Reverend Dr. Barbara Morton, and I have the honor of being your worship leader this morning. It is good to be in God's house this morning. I want to indulge you for just a moment, just three seconds. For those of you who have your physical Bibles, I want you to take them in your hands. For those of you who have your electronic Bibles, I want you to take those in your hand. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to just shake it. Hold it, but, but wait a minute, stand up and shake it. Just shake it. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, do you know what you just did? You just gave Satan the worst headache he's ever had. Good morning again, First Baptist. It's good to know that Satan has a headache this morning that Advil, Excedrin, or no other medication can cure because we have shaken him out of here with God's word. I'm going to ask all of our visitors to please stand. Oh, before I do that, I think it's morning prayer. We're going to have morning prayer. We're going to ask Deaconess Collins to come and take us to the throne of grace. Good morning. If you could please bow your head. Heavenly Father, thank you for waking, up to, waking us up this morning. Thank you for allowing us to see another day and to be able to worship in your house. We know that some of us may have had a difficult week, and we just thank you, Lord, how you continue to pour into us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us strength when we're weak. Um, I lift up those who are sick and shut in. I pray, Lord, that they know that they're not alone and that you are with us, whether we're well, whether we're sick. And we just thank you, Lord, for that. I lift up those who are grieving. I pray, Lord, that you just touch them and give them great comfort that can only come from you. Also, lift up the, uh, our youth. And I pray, Lord, that you just continue to guide them and bless them. We thank you, Lord. We're just so thankful for all that you do, all that you've done, and all that you will do. We also thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, and your kindness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. that we serve a God who is not a distant lover. God is present and at the center of our lives, keeping us focused on his grace, his mercy, his love, and his faithfulness. This time, I'd like to welcome all of our visitors. If you are visiting with us this morning, would you please stand so that we may welcome you? All right. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. The ushers are passing out 
uh, visitor packets. We ask that you fill them out and please place your card in the usher, in the offering basket. For those of you online, thank you for visiting with us virtually. COVID came and COVID's gone, COVID's back again, but God has provided a way for us to still worship together. So we thank you for being online this morning. If you are a first time visitor, please place a one in the chat. If you're a second time visitor, place a two in the chat. And if you're third, you know what you need to do. You need to come on the church. Amen, amen. I have just a few announcements this morning. Um, first of all, we are a preaching, teaching, and healing church. Preaching is on the way. Teaching is coming this week through the Christian Education Ministries Fall Churchwide Institute, which begins tomorrow evening, November 13th, and goes through November 17th. The Institute theme is soul care. We have a tendency to take care of our external bodies and parts of our internal bodies, but this week you're going to learn how to take care and have a healthy soul. Our scripture reference is Mark 8, 36 through 37. I would ask that you read it and be prepared to study. The session will open on tomorrow night at 6.30 with the preach word by the Reverend Dr. Lance Watson, senior pastor of St. Paul's Baptist Church of Richmond, Virginia. And he is a preacher. Uh, I've taken a few moments of class under him when I was in seminary. So he's coming with a word. The remainder of the week sessions will begin at 7, and there will be a light fair uh, served at 6.30, beginning on Tuesday evening in the John L. Wright Fellowship Hall. Please join the intercessory prayer ministry for prayer on Tuesday from 6.30 to 7. Share your prayer needs and join the call as we pray for one another. And in these times, we do need to pray for one another and for our world. Just a reminder that the small group ministry is launching in January 2024. If you are interested in being a small group facilitator or a small group participant, please email us at smallgroups at fbcog.org for more information. First Baptist will be celebrating Friends and Family Day. Say Friends and Family Day. Uh, not only are you to encourage someone, but you are to bring someone. Encourage and be, E and B, to church on November 19th at the 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. Uh, we will also be celebrating 123 years. FBG will also be distributing Thanksgiving food baskets to the first 150 families who text the word BASKET, B-A-S-K-E-T, in all caps to 443-222-0717. If you or another family member is in need of a basket, please be sure to send the text. Baskets are limited to one per household. Distribution will be on November 20th. Pickup time will be forthcoming. Volunteers are needed. Volunteers are needed. Volunteers are needed. Please contact admin at fbcog.org if you are available to volunteer. At this time, I would like to bring to the pulpit our pastor. He needs no introduction. Pastor, it's your turn. The Reverend Tyrone, Dr. Tyrone P. Jones IV. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. glad in it, for the Lord is good, and he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here in person, and thank you for joining us in the Cyber Sanctuary this morning. There are many places you can be all over the world now, and you decided to be with us, and so we don't take that lightly. We thank and praise God for our visitors, 
being with us today and worshiping with us as well. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Barbara Morton for leading us in worship. I just want to reiterate one, a couple of things that she mentioned. One, the kickoff for our Fall Institute begins tomorrow night. Somebody say tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at 6.30, amen. So we want as many people as possible to be in person, amen. This will be the first time we'll welcome the Reverend Dr. Lance D. Watson uh, to First Baptist. He is a phenomenal preacher. You don't want to miss him. And if you can come in person and be with us, if you can, please plan to do so so that Dr. Watson can see friendly faces in the audience, amen, on tomorrow night. We're also excited for the upcoming week of the Institute. There are wonderful classes that have been prepared for you, and we're going to be in, in teaching mode all week long. So please plan to come out and to be a part to, beginning tomorrow night at 6.30. And please, y'all, spread the word on that. Also, Reverend Morton mentioned that we are doing our basket uh, Thanksgiving basket giveaway. I just want to stress that when you put the word basket uh, in the text message, just one word is all we need. And that word is basket, basket. That's all we need. And then the subsequent text will come with you, to you, to allow you to fill out the information needed in order to get a basket. Uh, and we want to be a blessing to over 150 families. Current count is uh, 95 families have already signed up. Somebody ought to give God praise for that. Amen. The deadline, I believe, is November the 17th. I think that's right, November the 17th will be the last day that you can sign up or text for a Thanksgiving Day basket. And as you heard, we need volunteers to help us on November the 20th so that we can distribute the baskets to the greater community. Also, beloved, uh, we are gearing up for our friends and family day. Please invite a friend, invite a neighbor, family member, frenemies, whomever, amen to come and to be a part of our Friends and Family Day. And as you heard, we will be marking our 123rd year of existence as a church body. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Come on out, both 8 and 11, as we celebrate together. Amen. Also, beloved, I just want to just say two other things, and then I'm done. You all pray for me. Uh, I will be preaching for the Executive Board of the United Missionary Baptist Convention of Baltimore on Tuesday morning. So I know you can't get there, but just please, around 1030, drop your head and pray for your pastor, amen, as I'm to give the devotional message at Faith Baptist Church in Baltimore. And finally, I want to say, and I failed to say it at the earlier service, but I just want to thank God for a wonderful gathering of widows and widowers luncheon that we had on yesterday. It was truly a phenomenal gathering of wonderful people who have experienced great loss. And so uh, we are praying for them continually and we want to continue to cover this group. And I also want to publicly thank Deacon Karen Carter for convening this group together. Amen. We had a phenomenal time on yesterday, just gathering, recollecting, remembering, but also thanking God for allowing us, uh, for them to get through this, amen. Uh, that concludes the announcements for the morning. We ask that you would govern yourselves accordingly. This phenomenal choir is gonna come back. Aren't they phenomenal, amen? With a selection, and I'll be back with the word. Are y'all ready for a word? I'm ready to give it, amen. Come on, choir.
can live without Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 No way. We can live without you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, choir. ushering in the Spirit of God in this place. <laughs> when you think about just how good God has been, how he brought you from last week to this week, so you ain't even got to go back that far. You can think about last night and how God blessed you and kept you and never left you. Somebody ought to give God praise. I know, I know that it's heavy on some of you. The weight is upon your brow, but the Lord is able to lift that weight from your brow. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. There is a word from the Lord. Amen. I'm going to do my best to get to this word. Acts chapter 8. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. And I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible, verse 26 to verse 35. In your own personal private time with God, read chapters 7 and 8, which make up the context of this message. It begins the reading of God's word. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit told Philip to go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He, had, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. And who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may have your seats if you can. Amen. Starting a new sermon series today called The Essentials of Evangelism. The Essentials of Evangelism. And the first message in this series is My Witness After Worship. Please repeat after me, My Witness After Worship. Say it one more time, My Witness After Worship. One more time for the Holy Ghost, My Witness After Worship. Let's pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come grateful and thankful for this opportunity to stand and declare your word before your people. Thank you, Lord God, for the resignation, resonance of your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you, Lord God, that I can feel you moving from heart to heart and breast to breast. And now, God, that the atmosphere is conducive for the word, allow your word to penetrate hearts, minds, and spirits that we may be receptive, God, to what you shall feed us on today. 
God, we love you, we adore you, we bless you. God, I thank you for what you did at the early service. But now, God, I'm asking for a double portion of, of your anointing in this worship experience. God, we love you, adore you, and bless you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. The essentials of evangelism. My witness after worship. Beloved, evangelism, the word evangelism, put simply, means sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In other words, what will compel others to come to know Jesus is us as the people of God sharing Jesus with someone else. And our evangelistic efforts have to reach out to those who are in need of hearing this good news. In fact, beloved, God has given us this good news in order for the good news to go out into the world so that others may hear about the goodness of the Lord. So if God has given you a, pet, a testimony, if God has given you uh, something where he has solved your problems, if God continues to make ways out of no ways for you, you and I are supposed to share that with someone else. Tell somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is a part of the great commission that Jesus left us in Matthew's gospel where he says to go into all the world baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I'll be with you always even until the end of the age. But Jesus gives us specifics in Luke Acts chapter 1, verse 8 in particular, where he says, when you do this, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. I'm going to give you power to be my witnesses. And so it is important to understand, beloved, that if we've been touched in any way by God, and that we are now on the track and trail toward making heaven our home. As we are on our way, awaiting the return of our Christ, it is important for us to share our faith. In fact, wake up somebody in the service right now and touch them if you can, if they let you, and tell them, share your faith. You've got to share your faith. And so we find here, beloved, in this book of Acts, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, it provides for us a major shift in what God had pronounced through our Lord Jesus Christ that would happen. What we're seeing here literally is the words of our Christ coming alive. But we see the first phase of witnessing taking place in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all of Samaria. In the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, it outlines for us how the word of God began to spread through the region of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. We're seeing how God uses those who are willing vessels to be witnesses for him. It's only after we get to Acts chapter 9 that we see the scene shift with the Apostle Paul coming on the scene to share with the world as they knew it then. And Paul was called to witness to the Gentiles and kings and other people who would also hear the words of God. They are a part of the ends of the earth. What I want you to see also is that every phase, in every phase, the Spirit of God made a major move through the preparation of personal vessels. In other words, when we as the children of God are open to be used by God, God will turn around and use us for his glory that God's name may be magnified and that his kingdom may be sought. And it's important in this day and age that we be change agents for the kingdom of God, that we share our faith with others, that they might know who Jesus is. There is a major move afoot where God is wanting to use us in order that his word might go out and not return back void. 
You see, on Sunday morning, we come in here to get the word. But I always say we get the word in order to go out to serve. We get the word on Sunday, but we take the word that we get on Sunday and we go out with that word and we serve the greater world with our witness. And so I'm asking for a friend, are you prepared or are you preparing to be a witness for the Lord? See, what we see in every phase is a person who was willing to be led by God's Holy Spirit. Tell somebody, you got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Got to be led by the Holy Spirit. See, see notice, please, that, that we see two characters that are joined together, that are fulfilling the shifts and movement of God in the text. We see in Acts chapter 7, a man by the name of Deacon Stephen, who God used in unusual ways to make an impact for the kingdom of God. And we also see in Acts chapter 8 the likes of Philip who was also spirit-led and did what God asked him to do. The two come together in Acts chapter 6 when they were a part of the original seven that were called by God to serve the widows and to serve the orphans. They were called to wait on the tables to make sure that people were being properly served. They were commissioned to serve. But it's in Acts chapter 6, verse 3. The Bible says that they were chosen from among those who were already known to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. You see, when your spirit led, beloved, when you got God's spirit resonating on the inside of you, God can use you to do extraordinary things. So notice that they were called because they were already spirit led. Both Stephen and Philip and the others were spirit led. And they joined together not only to wait tables, but the Bible says that Stephen and Philip also preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And isn't that good news to know that it's not just the preacher on Sunday morning that has the good news, that you and I can take that good news with us out into the world. You don't have to be licensed or ordained in order to share the good news of Jesus. If God's been good to you, you ought to show some signs and tell somebody about it. And so it is. We see Philip and we see Stephen preaching. And the Bible also says performing signs and wonders. In fact, in Acts chapter 6 verse 8, it says that Stephen performed great signs and wonders before the people. And isn't that like God, that when you're an available vessel willing to be used by God, that not only will God use you for the purpose he intends, but sometimes God will lay some extraordinary gifts upon you in order to be a blessing to the body of Christ. It is here that they were able to perform great signs and wonders. Acts 6, 8 says Stephen performed those signs. And Acts 8, 6 says that when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, that they paid attention to what Philip had to say. In other words, beloved, when God gives you unusual giftings and gifts, you cannot rest or sit on those gifts. You've got to use them for the upbuilding of God's kingdom. However, we see at the end of Acts chapter 7 that Stephen, Deacon Stephen, had fulfilled his mission and call in the city of Jerusalem. And it is here as they were stoning him. Acts chapter 7 verse 60 says this. He says, Lord, forgive them for what they're doing. He didn't hold any animosity against anyone that was throwing rocks at him at the time because Stephen understood that I'm fulfilling the mission that God laid out for my life. When your life is purpose driven and you know what you're called to do, you can stand firm to perform all that God wants you to do. And the Bible says then he fell asleep. It's in this moment, beloved, of, of Stephen fulfilling his part of the deal and helping the people in Jerusalem to hear the word that we see a shift 
to Judea and Samaria. It's here, beloved, that a shift takes place. And after Stephen is buried, it is there, beloved, that as the shift takes place, that we witness Philip witnessing to others, that the Holy Spirit leads him to be able to proclaim and to preach. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, due to persecution, there was a great scattering of the saints among all the people in the known world at that time. Only the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And isn't that like God? God will allow something to become so unsettling that it will move you off the perch that you're currently sitting on in order to raise you up and to get you to do what God wanted you to do in the first place. Some of us think that troubles, the winds of trouble come into our lives because the enemy is beating down upon us. It's not just because of the enemy. Sometimes God allows some troubling winds to blow in our lives because because God knows if that wind hadn't blown, you and I would not have moved from where we are. But God allows persecution to come in in order to scatter us, in order that God's mission might be done. And here it is, beloved. I got to move here a little further. Uh, you got, here we see that the Holy Spirit moves upon Deacon Philip. And it's here after Stephen's death that we witness a great move of God. And what God shares with Philip is that he tells him, I need you to get on the road. I need you to go down south. I need you to get in a wilderness road heading south from Jerusalem to Gaza. He tells him, I need you to go because I've got something for you to do. And sometimes, beloved, you, when you're spirit-led, you don't question God. You just get to stepping. You don't question what's happening. You say, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'm going to follow. And what's interesting here is that Philip, in following what the Spirit of the Lord says, God moves him into unfamiliar territory. Tell a neighbor, unfamiliar territory. See, when God really wants to use you, what he will do is he will take you out of your comfort zone and place you in to unfamiliar territory. And sometimes, beloved, that's how God shakes us and wakes us. That's how God moves among us. He moves us out of a place of comfort and moves us in to the place of unfamiliarity. And sometimes, beloved, when God does that, it's a daunting task. It can seem scary. It can seem overwhelming. But just learn to listen to the Spirit and learn to let the Spirit of God lead you into unfamiliar territory. Listen, if you're going to share the good news of Jesus, You've got to prepare to move in unfamiliar territory. And some of you all can't witness past these doors. And some of you can't witness past your own doors in your own house. But I believe, beloved, after this series is over, that God is going to propel some of you and move some of you into unfamiliar territory where you'll be able to share your faith and share your convictions and share your testimony with somebody who needs to hear it. There's a voice out there that needs to hear what you have to say. There's an individual out there looking for a life-changing word from God. And I dare say that God wants to use you in order to bring that word forward. He's going to move you out of your comfort zone. So Philip now starts out on the road just as the Spirit of God leads him to do. And as Philip starts out, the Bible tells him that the Spirit says, I need you to run and meet a great man of importance. He meets this Ethiopian eunuch. He's Ethiopian, meaning he comes from the southern Nile region of Africa. And you know how I know he was important because the Bible says so. It's right here, beloved. It said he was an important official of the queen. He was an important in fish official in charge of the treasury of Candake, queen of Ethiopia. And it is here, beloved, he is an important individual. He is a man of status. He is a man of means. He is a man of wealth. He is a man who has his own chariot with its own driver, and he's moving along, heading home. He's, he's in his own Bentley coupe. Amen. 
sitting in the back, amen. No, no, he's in his own Maybach, amen. Sitting in the back with the reclining seats, amen. Reading aloud with the window down, amen. Got the gangster lean on, amen. I could just imagine. It says here, he's, he's Ethiopians, who we know he's a brother, amen. He, he's sitting back, reclining in the back seat. Uh, window is down, moving on, trying to head home. And he's reading aloud the scriptures. And what fascinated me about this is that this is an important man who was on his way home, but look where he came from. The Bible says, verse 27, that he goes on his way, this important individual, because he had just gone to worship in Jerusalem. Please don't miss this. I don't care how important you think you are. You ought to always make time to spend time in worship with God. I don't care what your status is at work. When we all come in this place, everybody is nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. I don't care how many degrees you have, how much money you got in the bank. I don't care what your status is on the outside. When we come in here, everybody is nothing more than a worshiper. And everybody understands that we're nothing more than a pile of dust that God has tended to bless over the years. Anybody grateful that God blessed your pile of dust? Kept your golden moments rolling on? Kept you doing what you need to do? He understood what it means to worship. But you got to see this, beloved. There are two things quickly I want to bring out. That this Ethiopian official was an important man but he was also a eunuch. It means that he was a castrated man. And so two things. One, this, this black man pressed his way to the temple, which means, beloved, he had a desire to worship God. And scholars say that this Ethiopian was not just an Ethiopian eunuch, but he was a Jewish Ethiopian eunuch. We know this because he was allowed to go into the synagogue and to worship. It says in the book of Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 10 that many Jews were exiled in Ethiopia and it was there that people came out of Ethiopia believing in the Judaic faith. It's also interesting, beloved, that five times right here in the book of Acts, it tells us that this black Jewish official was listed as a castrated man, which means that being a eunuch would have restricted him on how close he could get in the synagogue in order to worship. In other words, beloved, he had some restrictions placed on him as he was going in to the synagogue. But no doubt the eunuch pressed his way to worship because he saw some value in going to worship and giving God the praise. In fact, beloved, I don't have time right now. I got so much to give you. But in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 3 and 4, it talks about how God is on the side of the eunuch. Read it when you get a chance. It talks about how God blesses the eunuch that as they give of themselves, if they give themselves over to following the Sabbath day, and if they give themselves over to believing in the commands of God, even though they have no daughter or son, that their names will be memorialized in the temple and that their names will last forever in the sight of God. Isn't that a beautiful blessing? Sometimes, beloved, what you must understand is you don't know what it took for your neighbor to get to worship today. You don't know the hardship they had this week. You don't know the trauma or the trials that they've been through. But somebody on your road has had a hard week, but they pressed their way to worship. They had some challenges in their life, but they made it to the household of faith. They had so much going on, but they said, Lord, you've been so good that I've 
I've got to press my way to worship. Is there anybody out there that has that testimony? I really didn't feel like it this morning. I really didn't want to go to the house of worship. But God, you've been so good to me. And God, you've been so wonderful. And God, you've been so awesome. I have no choice but to come and give your worship and to give your praise. Is there anybody out there like that? I came to give God worship because he's been too good to me. Oh, when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, ooh, my soul cries out, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because it was only God that kept you. It was only God that spared you. It was only God that pulled you through. It was only God that pulled you out. It was only God that pulled you over. It was only God that kept your mind. Somebody ought to give God praise. Woo. So when you see me worshiping, don't worry about what I'm doing. You focus on yourself. I got to get it out while I've got a chance. Hey, hey. Oh, God. This man had restrictions, but he still pressed his way to worship. This man had some trials, but he still pressed his way to worship. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this important black man, who was impotent in body, faced impractical barriers, still pressed his way to give God worship and praise. Still pressed his way to say, thank you, Jesus. Still pressed his way, because I've discovered this, that when you learn the meaning of what it means to really worship God, you recognize that worshiping God is a worthwhile activity. Because how many know that God will bless you in the middle of your worship? He'll help you in the middle of your worship. He'll keep you in the middle of your worship. If you believe that it's worthwhile, somebody ought to give God praise. Oh. Oh. God. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, okay, y'all sit down. I got to give you this. I'm going to get us communion. Ooh, I got to move, I got to move. Listen, listen. See, see, I believe that a part of his reward for his press to worship was that the Spirit led Philip to run alongside the chariot in order for him to get a greater understanding of the Scriptures. See, if worship don't press you after worship, to want to continue in the ways of God, in the word of God, and in the witness of God, there's something wrong. You just checking a box. But if you really come to worship and you get filled with God's word and you want to know more about this God that you serve and you want to witness for him, you want to do something after worship that is meaningful. So here it is, beloved. I believe this that we have to be prepared to witness after worship. Note, notice the questions that arise out of the text after worship. Verse 30, please keep your Bibles open. Jesus, I'm not making anything up. Verse 30 says, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And watch the question Philip asked. Philip asked the question, do you understand, hallelujah, what you are reading? Uh, here, Philip is opening up with the possibility of a dialogue and conversation, seeing that this man is open to engagement. And beloved, that's all God is calling us to do as we witness, is that he's inviting us to open up a dialogue with somebody. Now listen, you got to go with those that go with you. If somebody turned tail on you and don't want to talk to you, you ain't got to be bothered. You ain't got to stray. Hey, 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 I'm talking to you. No, no, just let them alone. You planted the seed, let God do the rest. Because all you want to do is witness for the Savior. See, it's an invitation for him to have conversation and dialogue with the man. And I love the retort that he gives. Watch the second question, verse 31. He says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? 
So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Do y'all see that? This is where invitation leads to exploration. Uh, where you can come together, beloved, because as you're witnessing, when it's God designed and when it's God ordained, God then will open the door of invitation, allow you to walk in it, and then they'll begin an exploration of dialogue and conversation between you and the person who needs the word that comes out of your mouth. And so in this situation, beloved, we're seeing something significant here. Uh, Philip sits next to this Ethiopian eunuch. And they are reading Isaiah 53, 7, verses 7 and 8. And this is the writings about the suffering servant section of Isaiah. This passage highlights the weight of the crucifixion and being cut off from anyone else as our Lord is carrying this weight. And as our Lord is a victim of injustice. And this probably resonated with this Ethiopian eunuch because he is a man who has weight thrust upon him. He is a man who has been cut off in a way from being able to engage in certain ways. And so he too can resonate with the one that is being spoken about in the Isaiah text. And I love this, beloved, because what God will do is he'll use a word, a word to help somebody want to get to know more about our Christ. And as prepared vessels, if you ain't got word in you, how then can you share explanation of that word to somebody else? And that's why it's important to stay in your Bible on a daily basis. That's why it's important to read every chance you get. Listen, before you go to Instagram and Facebook, I know that's for the old folks, amen. But for you young people, before you go to TikTok, amen, you better open up your Bible and begin to read God's word because what you're doing is you're filling yourself with the word of God so that God can fill you to capacity only for you to share your faith with somebody else else but if you ain't got word in you guess what no word in you no word will come out of you and that's a lesson for somebody when you're going through trials and tribulations in this life if you don't have word in you how can you expect word to come out of you and word ain't gonna come out but something else I'm gonna leave that alone will come out of you notice this if you will that he resonates with the text and then the third question comes verse 34 he says, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Notice, if you would, that the invitation leads to now exploration. And exploration now comes to the place of inquiry that leads to impartation. Where now Philip is able to answer his question, a deeper Inquiry takes place. And, and Philip began, the Bible says, with this very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. He started with where he was, and then he explored more with this individual. He started with where he needed to get answers, and then he took him to who the answer really is. See, see, when somebody is hungry, you just can't tell them about Jesus. You got to feed them first and then tell them the food I just gave you was provided by my Savior who gave it to me so that I can give it to you. So sometimes, beloved, we got to meet people where they are. We got to pe meet people where their needs are and begin to answer their query and their questions. And see, that's why every good Christian ought to be able to share their faith. Who would serve a God like this that you're not able to even walk and talk about the Jesus that you know? Walk and talk about the Lord as your Savior. When you begin to impart, that's when the blessings of God begin to take place. But look at this. Here's the fourth question that took place, and this really amazed me. Because as he was probably getting word of impartation from Philip, verse 36 says, look, there's water here. Now that amazes me, Reverend Jay, because as they were going along, 
The Bible says that they were in a desert place on a desert road heading south from Jerusalem toward Gaza and nothing is there but desert road. But see, when you are supernaturally linked to God and when you're spirit led by God, what God will do is provide on the road ahead the very thing that's needed for transformation to take place. See, you don't see it yet, but just keep going down the road where the Spirit is leading. You don't understand what's happening, but just keep traveling where God is sending you, and God will provide you with the very thing that's needed. Because no doubt Philip told him about the fact that if you really want this impartation, you've got to be baptized. And Philip began with the passage explained about Jesus. He says, I see water here and then he says, what is to prevent me, God help me, from being baptized? Invitation, impartation leads to impact, impact. See, Jesus knew and the Holy Spirit understood that in order for Philip to have a great impact to close out chapter 8 before we go to Paul in chapter 9, we needed to see a great impact and impartation that comes from God. And, and see, where he had restrictions, God help me, in the sanctuary, he now sees no restrictions on the open road. In fact, ministry was done to a greater degree outside of the synagogue than it was inside the synagogue. In fact, most of the miracles that were performed by the disciples and performed by our Lord were done outside the sanctuary more so than inside the sanctuary. I hope y'all are getting this. God wants us to understand that we come in here to get his word, but we go out there in order to serve. We go out there and lay hands on the sick so that the sick will recover to let everybody know that it's an open road to Jesus. And so we come to church to get the word in order to go out to serve. Here's the last thing I'll give you. Finally, this thing messed with me as I was in my study. And what I noticed is the similarities between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's messed with me. Messed with me. Luke 24, verses 13 through 13 through 24. Look at it when you get home. Uh, that, that details for us the road to Emmaus. I'll summarize it for you. The disciples were on the road to Emmaus. In this instance, they were walking to Emmaus as travelers who were acquainted with Jesus, but who were mourning his death at the time. Uh, they were thinking that Jesus was going to come and take over Jerusalem and take over the city. And so their journey begins in sadness. But along the way, God help me. As they were traveling, the Bible says in Luke 24, down a wilderness road toward Emmaus. It is there that a stranger God help me, shows up, and that stranger is Jesus. And Jesus strides with them and asks them questions, gives them an inquiry, and they begin to ask questions to the stranger. And it's there, the Bible says, that Jesus begins to unpack the scriptures. He begins to unpack the scriptures all about himself and why he had to go to the cross and why he had to suffer, bleed, and die. And then they came to a place of sacrament. Jesus said, I need to go, but they said, no, sit with us. And it was in this sacramental element of him breaking bread that their eyes were opened. And the Bible says that they began to discover that who was walking with them but the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, this thing messed with me because I see something. I see something of a pattern here. I see something of a paradigm as it relates to how to effectively witness because watch what we see in Acts chapter 8. The Bible says the Ethiopian eunuch is on the dusty wilderness road. It is there that the Holy Spirit leads Philip to stride along near the chariot. He says a query to him. He asked him questions. He says, how can I know unless somebody unpacks the scriptures for me? He starts going with him in the chariot. And the Bible says that at that moment when he discovers that he wants more of Jesus, water appears out of nowhere. 
Oh, and then we see a sacramental element take place between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. A sacramental, what do you mean sacramental element dealing with baptism? You see, when he went down in the water, it's as if it was a breaking. It was as if it was a breaking from the past and a breaking from the old way of life. And when he came up out of the water after being fully immersed, it's as if there was a newness and awakening that takes place. That's when we do this every second Sunday. We take communion. It's supposed to be a breaking. It's supposed to be an understanding of what the Lord did for us on Calvary's cross, how he hung, bled, and died for us. Watch this. This blew my mind. Philip broke down the scriptures. He then did a sacramental moment of baptism, and water appeared out of nowhere. After baptism, like Jesus, the Bible says in Luke 24 that the Lord vanished in front of them. And watch what the text tells us here, that Philip was led away by the Holy Spirit. Look, 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 I, I looked it up in many different versions. In, 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 in the NASB version, in the New Living Translation, it says he was snatched away from their presence. He wasn't just taken away, he was snatched away by the Holy Spirit. And listen, the people on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus vanished, started to rejoice. Watch what happens when Philip is snatched away. The text says that when the eunuch who's just dripped dried from the water gets out of the water, the Bible says he started rejoicing that the Lord had come into his life. Do y'all see the pattern? Do y'all see the paradigm in the midst? That sharing our faith, unpacking the scriptures, giving people understanding, meeting them where they are in the time that they need it, allowing God to be unfolded in front of them, allows them to see more of Jesus. Less of me, Lord, and more of you. And the Bible says that they left there rejoicing. See, at some point, God will use us in unfamiliar places to speak to unfamiliar people. The stage is being set for you to be used by God so that rejoicing can take place in somebody's life. The Bible says that when one comes to Jesus, heaven rejoices and gives God glory and praise. See, I believe after this series, I prayed about this, and I said, Lord, I want to do evangelism. I want to reach out to lost souls. God, I want to help somebody understand that it's all about you, Lord Jesus. And God says, preach the word. Give them something to nibble on, amen, during the week so they can take this paradigm and use it for my glory to see the pattern of what happens, that unusual things take place in unfamiliar places among unfamiliar people. Let me close it like this. Warren Wisby tells a story about a man who testified before D.L. Moody in one of his revivals in Chicago about living for five years on top of Mount Transfiguration. Sometime in the 1920s. And as this man began to exclaim that for five years I lived on the same mountain where Jesus was turned. God help me inside out. I lived for five years on the same mountain where Moses was on one side of Jesus and where Elijah was on another side of Jesus. He said, for five years, I began to live in the same place where Jesus descended and shown himself to the disciples. The man kept carrying on before Moody, and Moody stopped him and asked, brother, while you were there on the mountain, how many souls were saved? Man start scratching his head and said, well, I don't really know. For the five years I was there, I was just so in awe of the fact that I was worshiping and praising God on the mountain, the same mountain where Jesus was transfigured, the same mountain where Moses and Elijah showed up. He said, brother, how many souls did you bring to Christ in just one year? He starts scratching his head again and said, well, I don't know. 
He said, I don't know if I led anybody to Christ, but I know I had a good mountaintop experience. I had a good experience because I was in the same place where Jesus was turned inside out, and I was in the same place where Elijah was on one side and Moses was on the other side. And Moody said to him these words. He responded, well, uh, we don't want that kind of mountain experience in our lives. What we want is for a person who's able to rise high but still able to reach down low in order to pull somebody up. What we want is not a normal mountaintop experience. We want an experience where people's lives are changed and transformation takes place. We don't want a regular mountaintop experience. And can I bother somebody today to say you should not want just a regular mountaintop experience on Sunday? Oh, it's good for us to gather in this place and worship God. It's good for us to gather and see one another and fellowship and see each other before the start of the week. But I dare say I'd rather be guilty, God help me, after the mountaintop experience of going out to the hedges and highways and giving God the glory by witnessing for the kingdom of God. I'd rather share the good news and tell somebody about a God who was able to pull me up out of the muck and miry of my life. I'd rather have an experience where I can share with somebody that the Lord is my trust and that the Lord is my God and that God has been good to me. And is there anybody out there that wants to share in what I'm sharing? Later for the mountaintop experience. Later for the regular Sunday morning worship. Lord, use me for your glory that you might be pleased with me. If that's your testimony, give God the praise. We ought to rejoice more for going out and bringing someone in than just for showing up and being present. I just said something there. We ought to rejoice more when we find out how many people have been brought into the household of faith. We ought to rejoice more when we see sinners being saved. We ought to rejoice more when we have a larger fellowship of saints of God that have been out there in the world, burned by the world, burned by the devil, but blessed in the city and blessed in the sanctuary. We ought to give God praise for that. I'm done. There's nothing like the good news. Nothing like the good news of Jesus Christ. And I believe this series is going to help us with the essentials of evangelism. We got to get back to evangelizing. We got to get back to what we know works. And that's in sharing our faith. I know we got all these modes of technology and I ain't mad at it, I love it all I do but nothing beats a personal encounter with someone that's in need nothing beats a phone call in order to reach out to someone you have not seen it's not just for the deacons, it's not just for the preachers God wants to use you I know you're saying, me, Lord. He says, yes, you. The one that did what you did last night, but you still showed up at church. Yes, you. The one that was fussing and fighting in the car before you got here. And then you told the kids, shut it when you got in the church. Yes, you. The the one that's had trauma and a traumatic experience all week long and you didn't know how you were going to deal with it but you found your way to the house of worship yes God wants to use you you're the right candidate you're the right person flaws and all 
because you can share your faith and tell somebody I'm not perfect but I serve a perfect God I don't always get it right but I know who is right and that's the Lord Jesus Christ so today we offer Jesus Christ to you step out on faith move out of your comfort zone and in to unfamiliar territory step out willingly and watch God use you won't you come for those of you on the other side of the screen you can email us at admin at fbcog.org or you can call us at 301-725-2600 someone will respond to you come on and become a part of the household of faith for those of you in person, the diaconate is here. The ministerial staff is here. Step out on faith. Take my hands, Lord. Touch my heart. If you can use anything, won't you come? Come on, let's do that again. anything Lord you can use me thank you God if you can use anything Lord you can use me take my hand touch my heart If you can use anything, come on, one more time for the Holy Ghost. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Somebody needs to step out of their comfort zone. Step out on faith. Say, Lord, I want to be you. Give God praise all over the building. Come on, if you want to be used, give him glory. Hallelujah. We've done as the Lord has commanded, and still there's yet room for more to be done. It's offering time in the sanctuary. Come on, give God praise. God has been good. So get your best offering in your hand. Give as unto the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, bless the hands of every giver in the house. Bless them, Lord God. And bless those who have a desire to give but not the means to do so. Help them to one day participate in this act of worship toward you. God, we bless you and adore you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, ushers. Come on, choir.
this is your season, give God the praise. Hallelujah, we always give God praise and glory in the midst of giving because God has already given so much to us. And so we pray that God bless you 30, 60, 100 fold in the spirit in which you gave that God would give it back to you. We're going to prepare now for the Lord's Supper. Amen. We're going to do this quickly. Amen. But also correctly. We want to make sure we give God his just due as we gather around his sacred table. But just before we do that, we're going to read the church covenant. For those of you at home, it will be on the screen. And for those of you in person, you can listen as I read aloud. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge and holiness, to give it a place in our affections, prayers, and services above every organization of human origin, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us, toward its expenses for the support of a faithful and evangelical ministry among us, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout the world. In case of difference of opinion in the church, we will strive to avoid a contentious spirit. If we cannot unanimously agree, we will cheerfully recognize the right of the majority to govern. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion, to study diligently the Word of God to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance, walk circumspectly in the world, to be kind and just to those in our employ, be faithful in the service we promise others, endeavoring in the purity of heart and goodwill towards all men, to exemplify and commend our holy faith. We further engage to watch over to pray for, to exhort and stir up each other unto every good word and work, to guard each other's reputation, not needlessly exposing the infirmities of others, to participate in each other's joys and with tender sympathy, bear one another's burdens and sorrows, to cultivate Christian courtesy, to be slow to give or take offense, but always ready for reconciliation being mindful of the rules of the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew to secure it without delay and through life amid evil report and good report to seek to live to the glory of God who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we remove from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. The church said amen. Let's prepare for communion. For those of you at home, please get your elements ready as we prepare to partake. Bible says that they gathered in an upper room. 
and it is there that the Lord supped with the disciples. The Bible says that he took the bread and broke it, blessed it, and gave it. Symbolic of his body on Calvary's cross. And Jesus took the cup and blessed it and gave it. Symbolic of his blood that cleanses us from all sins. And so, beloved, we come again around this communion table doing what the Lord has commanded us to do. As often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes back for us again. And so, beloved, I ask that you get in a, a place of introspection, take time to take an inward look at yourselves, see where you stand with God right now and with your fellow brother and sister. We're going to prepare after the prayer to partake together. I'm going to ask Reverend Aaron Powell Sr. to pray over the bread and if Reverend Denise Ford would pray over the fruit of the vine. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, it's once more and again that we come around this blessed table. Thank you, Lord God, that you have carried us from last month to this month. But Lord, in the last 30 days, we may not have been as faithful as we should have been. We might have erred, Lord God, and did some things in your sight that were not right. Yeah, God. Forgive us. Lord, forgive us. Please. Forgive us of our sins of omission and commission, sins we did that we were aware of, and sins we may have done unawares. And Lord, we're banking on your word that says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, and so, let a man or woman examine themselves, and then let them eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So we come with a penitent heart, Lord yeah, God, on today. Yeah, God. We come also thanking and rejoicing, Lord God, in the fact that you're soon to come. You're on your way back for your children, God. And so we do this in commemoration of what you did on the cross. But we're grateful that you got up, yeah, hallelujah, God. with yeah. all power in the palm of your hand. Bless us now, God, and keep us. This is our prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And in that night, with his disciples, Jesus took the bread. He break it, broke it and said, this is my body. Hallelujah. I give it, O oh God for the remission of mankind's sin. Let us take, eat now, in the name of Jesus, together. Thank you, Jesus. The wine, symbolic of the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary. Oh, yeah. Thank what you. Can wash away my sins? Nothing, Nothing. but, Nothing the, blood but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing, Nothing but, but the blood, blood of Jesus. Jesus. Take and drink together in Jesus' name. Thank you. Somebody ought to give God praise. Amen. Oh. Prepare to be dismissed. And it flows. Hallelujah. To the Lord's valley. Oh, yeah. The blood that gives me strength from pray our father and our God Lord Jesus we come now to the conclusion of this worship experience we're grateful Lord God for your word 
for your word tells us to share the good news of Jesus Christ to be led of your Holy Spirit and to be instruments for your glory so Lord God as we have come into this place to receive your word send us forth in order to serve that you might be pleased Lord God with all that we do bless us now and keep us Lord God continue to make your face to shine upon us until we come together as one family of faith it's in Jesus name we pray come on help me say it Jesus' name.